today. Um, good, first of all, good morning. I'm happy to be here. Um, we're going to be talking about filtering out the noise and the movements of an efficient swing. So how I wanted to set this up for you guys today is I wanted to first talk about the movement patterns of a swing before we then went into talking about coaching it and the drills and all that kind of stuff. I think it's very important to know the what before you go into trying to change anything and um, figuring out the why and the how of everything. Um, a little bit about myself, graduated from Notre Dame, um, drafted by the Phillies in the 11th round, played internationally in Australia for two years and ended up coaching over there as a high performance coach for three years. So I understand a lot of what you guys are going through at your local levels. Um, played in the Asia series, got my, um, like I said, started coaching in Australia and then I'm about to go into my third year coaching um, with the Houston Astros as a hitting coach. Um, first and foremost, I consider myself a teacher, okay, and a lot of times um, I haven't done a lot of these conferences or anything, but they say, hey, they want to know your top five drills. That's not who I am and what I'm about. I don't want to come here and give you all the answers. I'm a teacher. I want to give you the puzzle pieces so that way you can put together your, your own unique puzzle together yourself. Okay, so I t fully believe that give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime. I'm not here to do your work for you because I don't know your individual situation. I want to teach you the concepts so that way you can go back to your own state, country, area and apply these to your individual circumstances. Okay, so an overview. I'm going to be a little ambitious today and we're going to cover a lot of topics. I'm going to glaze over some stuff because I think it's important for you to know. If I go over something too quick, please write it down. Hey, can you go into more depth about whatever it is that we're talking about? Um, so we're going to talk about the problem with hitting and what's so confusing about teaching hitting. Then I want you to understand some important concepts. Um, we're going to talk about human movement. Um, we talked about that a little bit last night. I go off the premise of the swing's a collection of movement patterns. Um, that's all it is. Don't make it any more complicated than that. There is no perfect swing, um, but there is such thing as an efficient swing. And then once we talk about that, we're going to talk about the application and what to look for in the swing. Okay. Not every swing looks the same. If you watch big league baseball, Bregman looks very different than J.D. Martinez. J.D. Martinez looks different than Votto. Like, what's good, what's not good? How do you know? Like, that's the confusing thing about hitting. There's so much variation involved with it. It's a complete reaction. How do you know what you should be teaching towards? Because the greatest hitters in the world look completely different in a lot of ways. And that can make things very confusing on when to change things and when not to change things. First off, hitting's, hitting is extremely complex. It's just not as simple as like, hands here, elbow here, foot down, I can hit now. It's just not that easy. I wish it was that easy, but it's not that easy. Hitting is a complex system. Think about the weather, a weather system. It is dependent on the variables coming in, and with the variables that come in, it will then give you a different output. Okay, so the variables coming in, your reaction to that, is going to change what the swing looks like. The pitch height, the pitch shape, the batter's box, where the pitch is coming from, the angle of the arm, all those <laughs> things actually influence and like change what the swing could look like. So like, it's a com completely complex thing that is not black and white, and we have to treat it accordingly. So we do that through dynamic systems theory, a motor skill theory. Okay, and this is the idea that through, these through manipulating these constraints, we can produce a spontaneous behavior. Okay, so what that means is if I change the individual constraint, if I change the environmental constraint, if I change the task constraint, those are the variables. As those change, a new spontaneous behavior will come, come in. And everything that we do with hitting is about managing and manipulating these variables. Okay, so here's the problem. Nikolai Bernstein, okay, super smart dude, I don't need to go into a lot of detail, you can Google him. But basically he came up with and he realized the degrees of freedom problem, okay? The human has all these muscles and bones and structure, and because of this, and ranges of motion, we have a near infinite amount of movement possibilities. And with this near infinite amount of movement possibilities, there's multiple ways to do something. And so just like, like for hitting, with all the variation coming in and all the different ways I could actually swing a bat, which one is the right one? What do we focus on? 
how do we filter out all the noise and focus on the essentials so that way we can actually make change in a, an efficient amount of time. Okay, so before we go into that, we need to go over some background info. Okay, so these are some concepts that I think is really, really important for you to know. Okay, so mobility and stability. Okay, for the sake of this, we're going to define joint mobility as the degree of which two bones are allowed to move, being restricted by surrounding tissues, ligaments, tendons, muscles, otherwise known as the range of uninhibited movement around a joint. Okay? Full motor control capabilities to our end ranges. So if we cannot get to our full end ranges, if we get stuck somewhere in the middle, we do not have full mobility of that joint. We need to have full mobility of the joint to express full human movement. Okay? To, if we do not have that, we can attack it in different ways. We can attack joint capsule. We can distract it in certain ways. Soft tissue work. Everyone here has seen foam rollers and laying on the cross balls and doing different things like that. It's a good rule of thumb that like, if you touch on soft tissue, you should have no pain. If you mash on it, it should not hurt. If you mash on it or lay on the cross ball, like, oh, that's super tender. You probably have something going on with that soft tissue. And then you should be able to breathe deeply in that position. For this, we're talking about joint stability, or we can just even call it for this presentation, joint efficiency. We want it to be, we want it to be able to apply force and have full range of motion. So we want it to be mobile, but strong enough and not moving enough to be able to apply a lot of force with that joint. So we're seeking stable joints here. Not everyone's created the same. That's what makes this different. Some limbs are longer than others, and that, that can change things. Some people are naturally tighter than others. You have to assess that, and once you're looking at these things, determine, is this a mobility issue? Is this a stability issue? Is this just a motor skill thing? That they're not, they're, they're not in the right positions to apply force. Okay, so the terms that, of movement to be familiar with, a lot of this stuff comes from Kelly Surrett, um, MobilityWide. I took a course on him MY, at MY.com. I would highly recommend it. It's all about human movements. Um, the terms that we want to look at today are flexion, and we went over this yesterday, Paul went over this a little bit. Flexion, so flexion of the hip, or bringing the knee above the hip crease. Shoulder flexion, we could have hip extension, or shoulder extension. We have adduction, ab, so abduction and adduction, and then we have internal rotation, and then we have external rotation of the hip. So you're going to hear me refer to these terms quite a bit today. Okay, torsion. Torsion is incredibly important in stabilizing the joint and um, in able to apply a lot of force. The best way I can describe this is think about a screw. If you took a screw and you just lightly placed a screw on the on the, like a piece of board, it's, it doesn't stand on its own. It's it could be wobbly if you screw it in just a little bit. It gets less wobbly, and as you continue to apply rotational force. Through that screw, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Think about your hip joint and your shoulder joint as that screw. Okay, we don't want to work with wobbly screws. So we want to create torsion through our ball and socket joints, our hip joint and our shoulder joints. We have stable joints that can produce power and do what we want them to do. So like I always think about a screw. And a lot of times when you talk to like strength conditioning coaches, and um, people that understand movement, they tell you to put your foot on the ground and screw your foot into the ground. That's to create torsion through the hip. So I have a stable hip. There are two rules of torsion. So as a motion of flexion, so the hip is very easy to see. As I'm in a motion of flexion, my hip joint should have an external rotation to stabilize. So Whenever I squat down, should my knees go in or should they go out? Out, right? My knees are going in, I could have knee problems. That's because I'm not creating that stable hip joint with external rotation to create that torsion so I can squat down. So as you're in flexion or flexion of the shoulder, you need to externally rotate that joint to create a stable socket. Motions of extension. So if I'm standing in extension, you actually need to have a little bit of internal rotation to stabilize that joint. 
And understand that the body is always seeking stability when it's moving. Always. The body wants to be stable. It doesn't want to be flopping all over the place and hypermobile and not be able to produce force. Like Paul said yesterday, the ground is your friend. We want to have stable joints to produce force through the ground. Okay, Kelly Surratt, who does MWOD, talks about the tunnel concept as well. We need to be able to claim our end ranges. Okay, so if we start in a position and I was going to do an overhead press, I should not, like if I can't get in the proper position at the beginning, and if I can't finish in the proper position, I can't claim anything in the middle. So the beginning part of the tunnel dictates the end part of the tunnel and movement. So if you can't claim the end, you can't claim the beginning. If you can't claim the beginning, you can't claim the end. It's a tunnel concept. You have to have it all. And how you start absolutely will dictate how you finish. Went the wrong way. Okay. So how do we solve these new movement solutions? Okay. It's really complicated when you, you're dealing with such a difficult multi-joint, multi-faceted, complex movement and hitting, and it's reactive. So how do you have someone thinking about what their body's doing, and are they applying force, and are they in all these good positions while a 90 mile fastball is coming? Well, with Franz Bosch, I recommend looking him up and reading any of, his, any of his work. I'm going to reference him a lot throughout the day. He talks about we solve new movement problems with old movement solutions with similar intent. So what I like to do as a coach a lot of times is if I'm teaching something like the load, I will try to relate it to something that they already know what to do, or like a lateral jump, or a squat, or a movement pattern that they've, they've already accomplished. We were having a conversation this morning. We were talking about players playing handball. Maybe you can relate something you're doing in baseball to a movement they've already mastered in handball, or rugby, or some other sport that they've done. So it's important to understand the concept so you can re like, like layer it over all the different sports, and you can draw on these past past experiences to like speed up the process of learning. Okay, so now we're going to get into human movement. Okay, I chose this picture. This is an overhead squat. This is the fullest expression of human movement that you can be. We have a guy in a full squat. His knees are out, meaning his hips are creating external force in a flex position to stabilize. He has a braced trunk, braced spine, and he's in full overhead position with weight. That's full expression of human movement right there. So we're going to talk about the spine because we want to focus on spine first. If, our, if the car chassis is broken, we're not going to be able to drive straight. We got to make sure our spine is lined up and functioning properly. Then we're going to talk about the shoulders and the different arc types of the shoulders. And then we're going to talk about the different hip arc types. Okay, spine first. Sorry for the formatting. It got kind of changed around as we switched computers, but I think we can make do. So spine first. If our spine is not stable and it's moving throughout this movement, we're going to have problems in rotation, we're going to have problems leaking power, we're going to have, and have a higher risk of injury. So one thing that Kelly Surrett talks about in his program is we have to learn how to stabilize the spine first and foremost. And if we can't maintain a brace neutral spine throughout this movement, throughout athletic movement, and we start compensating in different ways, we're going to, we're going to leak power dramatically and, like I said, potentially risk injury. So how he talks about that is, we first things first, you need to make sure your feet are straight, not duck foot out or pigeon toed in, straight. Don't actively try to bring your pelvis underneath your body, just squeeze your glutes, and then breathe in, and breathe out. As you breathe out, you're cinching that your core down around your spine, and how he would describe it, we want our diaphragm and our core and everything to cinch down around our spine. So that way it's not moving as much as opposed to breathing out and having room for that spine to translate and articulate in there. We want to cinch that down so we have a stable spine to rotate around. We'll talk about that more in a little bit as well. So being able to do this 
and complete all these different archetypes that we're talking about without arching or flexing our T-spine, arching our lumbar spine, breaking down that brace neutral spine is paramount. It's huge. If we can't brace our spine just standing here, we're definitely not going to be able to expect that we can brace our spine when we're gearing up to swing at a 90 mile fastball. So the different shoulder archetypes. The first one, so what this is, is the archetypes. I should probably back up and give you a little bit of, a little bit of um, background on this. The archetypes. So like we talked about with Nicholas Bernstein, um, there's a, an infinite amount of movement that we can do as a human. But focusing on these core movement patterns that are the same across the world. So everywhere <laughs> around the world, we squat the same. You see people that can squat. Everywhere around the world, if you said, hey, go run, everyone runs extremely similarly. Everyone walks extremely similarly. Everyone walks upstairs, right? Like, there's some core movements that just human beings do. And those are like the foundational movements and the collection of those. If you combine these archetypes, hip archetypes, shoulder archetypes, you, are, you can pretty much do any human movement there is. So the first one would be the overhead archetype. This is full flexion and external rotation of the shoulder to stabilize. We should be able to get in this position without overarching our back or getting stuck here because of mobility. Full range of motion, brace neutral spine into an overhead position. The next one is we should be able to get into a full press position as if we were doing a push-up. Next, we have the hang archetype. So I'm, now I have internal rotation and more extension of the shoulders. And the next one would be a front rack position, or you can even go here. And think about this as far as stability and torsion as well. Another example, if you put your hand, everyone put your hands out in front of you. Get palms down. You can like turn to your right to your partner. I'll use, use you for example. Don't let me push you down. Okay? There's some, there's some give there. Now externally rotate. Don't let me push you down. There is no give there. He created torsion in that joint and has way more power now. Bad position, no power. Good position, power. So this is another big example. I'll pull someone up in a second when we start talking about the load and show you that with the hips. So creating torsion and being able to get in these human movement archetypes is the foundational movement of everything. If we want to talk about how do I do a clean, it's flexion into extension, into a hang archetype, into a press, into an overhead archetype. So this is human movement. Mastering this and understanding this and looking for this and everything that we do is huge. Now hip, hip archetypes. For the sake of hitting and producing bat speed, which everyone wants to do, we're probably we're going to focus more on these than the shoulder. But the first one would be a hinge. I should be able to brace neutral spine, send my hips back, and be able to hinge over without arching or flexing my, my back in different ways. I should be able to keep brace neutral spine all the way down. <clears throat> if I want to do a squat, it's going to be a hinge, and then I'm dropping with stable hips. The pistol position, I'm not even going to try it for you, sorry. <laughs> the pistol position, that attacks dorsal, um, the ankle, Hip flexion, full hip flexion there. And then finally the lunge. We want to be able to get our knee well beyond our hip and be able to squat down without overarching our back and get into a good hip position. Okay, the hinge. The hinge is something that I focus on a lot. I think is one of the most important things that we do, especially as a hitter. So we should be able to, if we wanted, if we held a downhill, dowel here, or this fungo, I should be able to maintain three points of contact and send my butt back to maintain that brace neutral spine. What this does, and why this is important, we hinge every time we go to swing. <clears throat> every single time we go to swing, we're hinging over. So as soon as we go into our load and start to engage in on the pitch, if we're leaking energy because we don't know how to hinge or send our butt back or turn our posterior chain on 
or even we don't have a good proper stable spine, we're killing ourselves. So it all starts with that. If we can't simply do a quarter hinge, we're already leaking power in the swing. So why does it matter? I already hit on it a couple of times. One, I got guys all year long. We got 145 to 170 games going on a year. We're taking 100 plus cuts a day. If we're doing different things with our spine and not getting a good position, it's weird. Somewhere around June, July, guys start saying, man, my back hurts. I've been lifting in the weight room. I've been taking all these cuts. My back hurts. I'm starting to break down. Always around game 100, guys are getting exhausted and they're, they're breaking down. Well, they move like crap. They move like crap and every day they're doing 100, 200 reps of something and they're just banging bones against each other and not using their bodies properly. And over time, it starts to hurt a little bit. So like, you can, it's way different than pitching. Pitching, you can throw a ball and boom, your arm goes. It's not quite like that in hitting a lot. But over time, sore backs, obliques, Different things like that can come up for this. And really, let's be honest, you talk to professional hitters, they'll deal with the sore back, but if you point out that they're leaking power, that's a big deal. So if I have less bat speed because I'm not moving right, that's a big deal. If I can't hit the balls far because I'm not moving right and not getting into good positions, that's a big deal. So we want to be in these good positions so that way we can maximize our God-given ability. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to maximize our ceiling. Okay, so now we're going to apply what we know to what it looks like in the actual swing. Okay, so again, Nicholas Bernstein. There's a million different ways to move, right? I don't know what to look at. Oh my God, when you swing, it looks different than when you swing. And when you swing, it looks different than you swing. You're hitting 270. Should I change you or what do I even change? There's a million questions out there. Focus on the movement. That's it. The rest is noise. Okay? If they can hit the movement archetypes, and you can see those movement archetypes expressed in the swing, that those are the big things. Create it like a checklist. Okay? The next slide, I think. Yes. This one? Okay? So Franz Bosch talks about attractors and fluctuators. Okay? These human archetypes are the attractors. The attractors are stable, consistent movement patterns that complex systems, hitting, dynamic systems theories we talked about, complex systems, that they gravitate to. That's why everyone runs the same. Everyone jumps the same. Everyone squats the same all over the world. These are stable movement patterns. The fluctuators, the noise, are the variable movement patterns that combine with the attractors, uh, the actuators, sorry, to make a near infinite amount of movements. That's what makes each individual look unique. So I'm looking for core concepts when you swing, but there's a lot of noise around those core concepts that I can ignore because those are just your little things that make you you. And if I spend every second of my day stressing over things that just don't really matter, I'm wasting my time. And when you're trying to change not just one athlete, but a ton of athletes, time's of the essence. And when I got a guy for 20 minutes a day, one-on-one, -on -one, before we go out to BP or whatever we do in a professional season, I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste his time. So when he steps into my cage, I want to know exactly what's going on and exactly how to tackle it. So we strip it down to these basics. The variables that will come in from the pitch and all the other stuff, that makes up the fluctuators. We're focusing on the archetypes and the stable movement pattern. Okay, so a quick recap before we move on. What do we know? Hitting's a complex system. It's dependent on a lot of variations. Okay, everything looks differently. There's attractors and there's fluctuators. We're gonna focus on the attractors. We know that when we wanna teach something or solve a new movement pattern, we wanna rely on old movement solutions with similar intent. We also know what the different movement archetypes are. We have the shoulder, overhead, press, front rack, um, so press, front rack, and then, yes, the overhead, you have the, the brace, right, here. And then we have the hip archetypes, hinge, lunge, hinge into a squat, and then, again, pistol. All while maintaining 
a brace neutral spine. We also know that torsion creates stability in the joint so we can apply more force. And we also know that our start position dictates our end position. Okay, look at these positions. Pretty similar. Pretty similar. Pretty similar. Efficient throwing, striking, and swinging are a result of properly timed weight shifting from the back foot to the front foot. This linear power transition turns into rotational power when the wave of energy um, generated in the lower body reaches the upper body, creating a throw, swing, or punch. This is Gray Cook. These are stable positions in rotational movements, and it's not shocking to see them performed in rotational sports. These are the things we want to look at. These are the positions we want to mimic. This is the essential stuff. Okay, so the swing. Now we're going to relate everything we talked about back to the swing. Okay, so I broke it down even in more detail into five areas. We're going to look at the setup, the load, the transition, rotation, and then deceleration. So we want to focus on the movement archetypes and our core principles in each of these, each of these moments of the swing. So back to the, the stable spine. It's important to have a stable spine. Look at this block. So as that green line is not moving, the rotation is clean. Then as soon as that green line starts to wiggle a little bit, you can see how the rotation gets thrown off. This is a prime example of having a stable spine to rotate around and then having your spine translate and move while you're trying to rotate. Clean rotation, stable spine. Bad rotation, spine moving all over the place. So that's why we focus on having a brace neutral spine and the spine first approach. So for me, I like to have the spine set up as close to possible as where you're going to rotate from. So Robinson can know, love it, spine already going down his front leg. We want our spine down our front leg because as I rotate, put this down, as I rotate, I have a little bit of a swing to hit the ball in the air, right? If I'm in the, my spine's going down my back leg, if I just cleanly rotate, I'm hitting a ball on the ground. Okay, we want line drives and balls in the air, so we want to set up our spine down our lead leg. Spine set up, ready to go with minimal yeah, movement. Jeremy, can I ask a quick yeah. question? So if I got you right, if you were working on a computer right now and you would show it to a player, you would draw a line from the foot all the way to the back yes. shoulder? Yes, you'll see. I have a slide next that'll have that on there. Yes. Mike Trout, vertical spine, but not a big movement to get back a little bit if he needs to. Prince Fielder, not bad. But you can see there's a little bit of an oblique crunch right here. That's not a stable spine, and that's starting to move in a direction that I don't personally love. And what happened to him? <laughs> what happened to him in like this picture, or no, no? I mean, in his, I mean, what ended up in his career? He ended up having neck problems. Yep, yeah, neck problems, a lot of issues, a lot of injuries, right? And so like he had this compensation in his load. And then the only way he could, only thing he could do as he came out of it, as his body wants to stabilize, is there's going to be movement and translation in a very powerful rotational movement. Over time, that's not a good thing. <clears throat> so the setup, keys on that, spine as close to where we want it to be as possible, to simplify. Okay, common mistakes that I see. Remember, hitting is weird. It's not black and white. So like, do I like this? No. Could he hit? Yes. It's not black and white. Remember, there's not a perfect swing. There's a lot of variables that go into hitting that make it really complex. Hand-eye coordination, bat to ball skill, pitch selection, pitch recognition, all these things. But as far as efficient movers and being in a great position, I would not teach that position. He has to make a big movement to get his spine into a good spot to rotate. 
Another issue right here, we'll talk about this more in a second. First thing we talked about when we want to have a brace neutral spine is feet straight together because we don't want to have a duck footed problem. Now we broke the chain and now I'm not going to be able to create as much torsion through the hip and I'm not going to be able to load and use my hips as properly. So when you see guys kicking their feet out or kicking their feet in when they're about to swing, that's a, sh that's a sure sign that they're not going to be able to stabilize their back hip eventually. And finally, who here thinks they can squat down in that position right there? Negative. You can't. Again, dude was good. He could hit. But that doesn't mean he was an efficient mover, and that doesn't mean he wasn't leaking power. He may have gotten back to a good position, but again, it's less consistent. We're not dealing with the Moises Alus of the world here, right? We want, to, we want to deal with our guys and try to make them as efficient as they can be so that way they can have the best chance possible. So now we're going to go into the load. Here's your slide with the arrows. Franz Bosch calls this a hip lock position. This is a hip lock position. He calls it an attractor in most sports. If I was going to change direction, if I was going to laterally jump, this is the position we want to get into. It's a, it's a stable position for the hips when exposed to large opposing forces, i.e. rotation. The characteristics are the front hip ends up being higher than the back hip. The back hip moves behind us because we're going into a hinge position, just like you talked about yesterday. And the spine is aligned down the front leg. Babe Ruth did a pretty good job of it. Doesn't mean he would hit today, but he did a pretty good job of it. He wouldn't be swinging a 46 ounce. He would not be. He would not be. <laughs> so I picked the, these pictures are up here because you can see righty, lefty, spine, hips, good position. Looks differently. Different leg lift, different hand positions, but the hips are still the same. We have a stable hip here. Stable hip here. Hip lock position. There's a hinge going on here. There's flexion and external rotation creating torsion. So common issues. We got Jose Altuve, who's pretty stinking good. Look at his knee, which is good, compared to this knee. Can I get a volunteer? Someone who can, who can like, squat. Squat down. <laughs> All right. Can everyone see? Go into a squat. Okay. The importance of torsion. Okay, that's fine. Make sure your feet are straight, okay? Don't let me push you in. So push your knee against me. See how this firms up? That's a stable hip. Now point your toes out, okay? Do the same thing. Weaker? Yeah, of course. Much weaker. All we did was open his toes out. He broke the chain. He cannot stabilize the hip anymore. Way weaker. <laughs> Okay, a way that we talk, I've talked about this before, stand up a little bit. We want the back leg to be able to, if I put a weight on this, to be able to absorb that weight. If I'm kicking my back knee in, I'm unstabilizing this hip and I have no choice. This hip is now weak. I cannot drive off this back hip. My load and my swing is now officially compromised from the get-go. Thank you. So that's a good example of just like the arm thing of if I can't externally rotate through this hip to stabilize, I am unstable, I am weak, I can't maintain my positions, I'll break down. I promise when you start looking at this, you're going to see a lot of guys in the big leagues and around your area that start off like this and their knee goes, and then it goes back to a position, but we don't want our knee to wobble in our swing. We want to be stable from the get-go. Another thing that we'll see is sway. They talk about sway a lot in golf. This line right here was where his head started. As he floated, he swayed back, kicked his back knee in because someone told him, hey, we don't want a lot of head movement in your load, which is true. So he artificially tried to stop it. And then he started still trying to sway. And what happens to my spine when I shut my hip off and start swaying? A lot of translation in the spine there. Altuve sits, hip hinges into a good stable position, looks as if he's sitting on a chair, stable spine, ready to rock. Okay, 
now we've loaded. Now we want to transfer pressure. Okay, I love this golf visual. This is the linear motion of the swing. I don't like saying a swing is linear because you're rotating. That's what you're doing. There is a linear component of rotation, but I'm not a fan of saying like, oh, it's a linear swing. It's not. It's a pressure shift. Let's call it a pressure shift. We need to go from a stable back hip. We need to transfer to a stable front hip so we can then rotate. We want to do that because of Newton's first law of force production. Okay, you can go to this website. We can get this from you later. It'll be put up there. Ideally, we want to be able to stabilize this back leg, apply some lateral force, stabilize this front leg to actually rotate by applying force to the ground. You can see the force applied there to actually start the rotation. We want to shift our pressure. We don't want to shift our center of mass. So we want to load without head movement and maintain our center of mass to then get here and apply pressure without my head and my center of mass moving around a lot. So what does pressure transfer look like? So there's going to be some flex in the front knee because you're absorbing that pressure transfer. And the heads behind are closer to the catcher than the hips. This is also keeping the spine in that good position down the lead leg. So once you're in this position, now we're ready to rotate. Now we have a kinematic sequence. Okay, hips, then torso, then arms, then club. It can be, I've heard different studies and sayings that like, technically there's not a lot of difference if the arms and the torso are switched, but like, I'm going with this. I want the torso to bring the arms, the hips to bring the torso. Rotation, and this all starts from applying force through stable hips. Remember, stable hips apply more force. The more force you can produce, the more power you're going to have. So, poor posture and unstable hips and poor pressure can lead to a bad sequence. Okay, I don't know if everyone can see this. Right here in the load, if you have too much weight on the front foot, and your spine's going down your back leg, when you go to rotate, it's going to swing your spine back, which then is gonna put more weight on your backside than you should have. Reverse spine angle, chunk, divot, flare, not a good thing in golf, not a good thing in baseball. This also changed your sequence. So hips, torso, lead arm, back club, the reverse spine angle creates, gets the arms going first. It takes away the hips and the torso and it gets the arms going way too early in the sequence, which is no point. You can see an example of it right here. So you see how he's here and then has to slam his weight back. So this is a big thing that I talked about a lot in Australia with young kids. It's very common to have a young kid come in and you talk about rotating and you just see them up, make sure everyone can see my feet, make sure everyone's going. The foot doesn't start the rotation. The hips start the rotation. We're loading up and we're, we're like you said yesterday, we're rotating the pelvis. And we're doing that by applying a ridiculous amount of force through the ground. You can see his pelvis is rotated and his foot's still here. He is now into extension an archetype of the hip, which you can see his big toes on the ground here because he's having to internally rotate to stabilize that joint now. And that's all being transferred into the front hip, which is stable, which will end up being extended and stabilizing on that side. So it all starts with the hips. The hips will bring the knee, the knee will bring the foot. If you start having a guy squish the bug and start everything with their foot, you're going to have a lot of issues there. And it's hard to see at times. It really is. So make sure the hips are running the show. Shoulder joint the swing. This is something that, I'll be honest, I'm speculating on a little bit. Everyone focuses on the lower body a lot, but let's use our core principles here. We have the press arc type, and we have the front, front, um, the front rack. Okay? So the reason we would want to do a press is we want a scapula to keep that, like to attach this arm to our spine to rotate. We don't want this to move independently. We want to connect it and be more powerful. So if I'm here in a push-up position, 
this is a good position to be in. If this is above my shoulder, this is not a good position to hit from. This is not a good position to carry weight from. This is a unstable shoulder right here. So I don't think we should have that when we swing. And a lot of people actually talk about it and teach it, and they're trying to create a lot of separation. But in the golf world as well, they talk about you can actually have too much separation. So as you see here, his torso is turning, and his arm, back arm, is nowhere, is, is still completely disconnected from his spine and his body. That I think is that think I think that causes problems because that's an unstable shoulder joint driving the train. Okay, then we want to decelerate what we did. Think about inertia. Posterior chain decelerates. We want to throw everything with force, like we're a motorcycle, into a buck, like a stack of tires, and our hands in the bat are the dude on the motorcycle flying forward. The more energy we can create, the more inertia we can create, the faster our hands come. Okay. We want to do this all with proper intent. Everything we do has to have good intent. Our intention starts our, like creates our motor skills and our motor pattern. If we have bad intent, if our intent is to hit a ground ball, we're not going to swing the crap out of the bat. Why do we want to hit a fly ball? Because there's just more hits and there's more production in the air. And I'm not saying straight in the air. I'm saying right here between 10 and 30 degree launch angle, you start getting hits consistently at 60 mile an hour exit velo. So ground balls at the level you're about to go to, what happens when they hit a ground ball? It's an out. It's an out. It just is. Okay. So focus on the movement concepts. Ignore the rest. Is my hitter to replicate the needed hip shoulder archetypes in his or her swing? Can they brace their spine? Are they mobile enough to get into these archetypes to begin with? Are they using stable joints to produce force and efficiency? Quality movement plus quality intent plus the uncontrollable variations are the inefficient, are the efficient swings. So the what? The swings a collection of foundational human movements. Focus on those movements, the rest is noise. Why? Owning these movements provides the best opportunity to generate maximum force, creating bat speed and efficient swing to drive the ball in the air. How? That's going to be up to you, and we're going to talk more about the how next presentation. We'll go over how to create your own solutions to these movement problems. Thanks, guys.